Hi, welcome to God's Stories today. My name's Chris Thompson. You guys coming? Hello and welcome to God Stories Today. Um, I am super thrilled that I have the company this morning of someone I've known now for, well, probably about three years almost right, now, yeah. um, Esther Pollard, who is, I'm going to hopefully get this semi right and then you can tell us what it really, really <laughs> means. Um, she is the diocesan secretary of Truro Diocese in the southwest of the country. Um, and she's, please take this the right way, all right? She's quite scary. <laughs> I know she means and you like the head teacher sort of way, right? She's got that sort of authority about her, which is really cool because the kind of work she does, uh, you kind of need to have that gravitas about you, you really do, as we will delve into in a moment. Thankfully, she's laughing and she doesn't want to kill me because said she's scary. And if she wanted to kill me, it would take about five seconds, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, um, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> I'm not going to stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Um, as per usual, uh, please do tell everyone about this. Please do subscribe. Um, it is all for the glory of God. It really, really is. Um, check us out on social media, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Look at God's Stories today. And if you want to email me for any reason, um, hints and tips about the channel, developing the channel, promoting the channel, so I feel like God's asked me to sort of do that now, um, please do ping off an email to godstoriestoday at gmail.com. Hello, Esther. Hello. <laughs> we made it. We did. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we kind of that that comment was that we, we we tried to do this about I think about a month ago. That's right. No. Um, but you were just overwhelmed with work and yeah. other such stuff. As you'll see why in a minute when she tells you what she does. Um, and actually, I've, I'd like to elaborate on what you do once you give your description. But it's great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. So, so what, what do you do then? I've said you're a diocesan <laughs> secretary, but what is that? Yeah, well, the, the, the most important thing to say is my tea is rubbish. Your tea is rubbish? I don't make good tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously, people think, you know, what does a diocesan secretary do? Um, and in essence, kind of in layman terms, I'm a chief operating officer for the diocese. So I, I need to make sure things work operationally, uh, support the bishop and the senior team, to make sure that you know they can focus on ministry, uh, and I deal with the issues like property and buildings and land matters, and mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and making sure we've got the resources in place to do God's work across Cornwall. Boom! There yes. you go. <laughs> See what I mean? It's a really heavy job. Um, just for you, uh, if you're not part of the Church of England, the Church of England is divided into sections right across England itself. There's about 42-ish dioceses, and in each diocese there is a diocesan secretary and as you've just got it's a bit of an insight here it's more than just taking the minutes and being a secretary uh, it really is like you run everything it's like you're the lay bishop of that entire area it really is um, and and therefore it's a huge job and that's why she's a bit scary <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're, we're going to delve now into your gold story and i just want to say this and we will get started i promise you bless her she sent me through some some notes about some mile marker moments in her faith journey but they're quite cryptic and I purposely haven't asked her for any sort of like clarification on them until this point so that we can actually journey together on them. But for instance, we'll get to this in a minute, but it says here in our very first one, uh, bare feet in the house of God or shoes, me and the house of God. Now, what does that mean? We're going to find out. Where were you born? Uh, well, I was born in the Netherlands. Um... In a, in a place that's in the north, um, northwest, um, and uh, in my third year, I moved to the Dutch West Indies, right. uh, and that's where I grew up. And uh, uh, my stepdad was a, a GP uh, on one of the smallest islands, um, uh, which was just a, a, an amazing upbringing. Mm. Um, uh, you know, just about 800 inhabitants on the island. 800? Yes, yeah. And, you know, we we didn't know what a television looked like. Um, so it was, you know, and playing outdoors and, and you know, I, I'm 
not scared to admit that at the time I was I was a tomboy. I, oh. You know, I did run around uh, on, in bare feet, <laughs> and um, yeah, just played outdoors and you know in the scrublands and wow. Um, and when you look around nowadays, where the space has become so much smaller, mm. and obviously with modern technology. The kids don't really have that valuable outdoor time that they should. Mm. Uh, that was just an amazing time to, to grow up. Wow. In my mind, <coughs> I've got that amazing Disney movie, <coughs> Moana. <laughs> what, what is, what is the, your island? What does it yeah. look like, just for us who, who, yeah. who don't know? So the island is called Saber, yeah. and um, it's one of the six uh, islands that's part of the Dutch um, colony, if you like, uh -huh. if, they, if you call it that way. So they're in the West Indies, and uh, this island is very close to St. Martin mm -hmm. and St. Eustatius. And this island is literally, if you can imagine, just a rock coming out of the ocean. Oh, really? And, and, that, and it's called the Unspoiled Queen. So going to find you guys a picture, and it yeah. only come up on yes, the screen. Yes, you, you, you must. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it's a, obviously a very small community with very small villages. And um, believe it or not, the capital of the island is called the Bottom. <laughs> and I'm not making this up. <laughs> um, but you know, it's because it's so small. Of course, everybody knows each other. Mm. And uh, at the time when I grew up there, you know, the the, the, the island's economy you know, thrived on on fishing. Um, there's not a lot of you know, and on tourism because literally there's nothing else yeah. um, and usually with kids going to school there you, you at the time when I grew up it was basically you know um, primary primary school mm -hmm. and then you'd have to leave the island oh, really? um, so yeah but we left the island before actually I, I got to that age so um, so what was it like growing up there in terms of your faith well, did, uh, you, did your parents yeah. have a faith was there a faith mm -hmm. was, was Christianity on the island well it the faith there was incredible. Um, for me, and growing up, and my understanding at the time obviously was very limited. Mm. Um, but th there was a Catholic school, and that's the only school that there was. Right. And it was uh, managed and run by nuns, and they were Dutch nuns. Right. Um, and uh, so I went to kindergarten, and then after that I went to primary school, and it was called Sacred Heart School. Okay. Um, and and there, there, you know, there are a couple of churches on the island, and there was Sunday school, and it was just part of life. And all my friends at the time, they were all, you know, because of their families and and, and their faith, mm. uh, they they were baptized um, and confirmed, and you know, and I remember so vividly that you know one day I went to my mum and I said. Why can't I be confirmed and why can't I be baptized? And um, like all my friends are. Mm -hmm. and, and she said, well, I think I want you to make that decision when you're old enough, wow. when you understand mm -hmm. what you want out of life. And did you feel both? <coughs> well, what, how did that make you feel? It, it, it kind of, on the one hand, and because I was kind of really young, uh -huh. um, on the one hand, it, it felt okay. But I think it probably gave me more questions than okay. than answers, really. But that was what it was, you know. That's that was the decision my parents made. Mm. Um, so you know, you can't you you live with it. You know, mm. it's kind of like having those conversations and think, okay, that you know, you're you're my parent. <laughs> you know what's best for me, and um, so I never really questioned it. Mm. <clears throat> but despite all of that, I mean, obviously, I still went to school still had those amazing values and for me it was always there was always god around so god felt real even at that, <clears throat> yeah. that young age yeah yeah wow that's amazing yeah so did you pray to god did you feel like your relationship was 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 alive and active um it's really hard to describe at mm -hmm. that young age i mean because i felt there was some always someone there looking mm -hmm out for me but I couldn't really because I wasn't part of the the community so I couldn't really understand it deeply mm -hmm. but still within me there was this sense of yes you know there's somebody there mm -hmm. I, I know I'm safe um, 
and you know, obviously, as you grow up, there are times when you, you well, I could possibly describe it as kind of turning your back on faith because mm -hmm. you think that there are other priorities in your life, <laughs> <laughs> like growing up and being a teenager. Um, so, but there was always this sense of a deep love, mm -hmm. uh, even though sometimes I felt I didn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. But you know, that, that was, yeah, it was really important to me and, and values in life and being kind to people and um, helping people and supporting mm -hmm. people. That's always been part of my drive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So God felt like he was present right from the very get-go. Yeah. And he felt like he was just, uh, the impression I'm, I'm getting is that he felt like he was kind of like, it permeated all, all parts of life yeah. in that sort of, yeah. I just feel like there is this amazing person yeah. looking after me. Yeah. And it clearly affected how you felt about yourself mm. and how you wanted to interact with people. Yeah. It's about helping people and yeah. loving people and so forth. So it was powerful right from the beginning. Mm. That's amazing. That's really mm. wonderful. It really is. I love it when people have had conversion experiences, yeah. but there's a part of me that loves it just as much, if not more, yeah. when people have had God <laughs> in their lives right from the beginning. Yeah. And it just feels like it's always been there. It's, yeah. it's, it's natural. natural. It's normal. Yeah. Yeah. Which I guess is what it's yeah. meant to be in God's yeah. eyes. That's yeah. just wonderful. Yeah. So were there any like God moments, if you can remember, um, you know, when you were growing up, you mm. know, where, where God sort of like burst through or did something and made you think, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I could go into the shoe story. Oh, yes. Let me read it for you again, OK? <laughs> I want to tell you what I think is going on here, because my head's been going all over the place. But I think I've landed on something which is no doubt wrong, OK? So I read it for bare feet in the house of God. That makes me think of... Like, you know, the, the story in the Bible, I think it was Moses, take your, take your shoes off because this is a sacred place. So I'm obviously my, my mind's going somewhere there. So I'm thinking there was like a Moses moment in your life, maybe. Yeah. Um, or shoes, uh, me and house of God. So I'm thinking, was there a point where you thought God was calling you to some sort, this is where I'm going, some sort of religious life, like proper nun religious life, or were you meant to be out in the world, sort of like being a religious person in the world? Like that kind of precipice sort of thing, like that way or that way. Probably got it really wrong, but over to you. <laughs> I'm so going to disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of give you a little bit of a hint. As when I was growing up, I was like a, a real tomboy. I, I was out there and in, you know, kind of in the bush and, you know, friends and playing outside and on rocks and in, you know, old cars and things. And I, I never wore shoes, never. Really? And my, my, and because of the island where we lived, um, that everything has to be imported. So now and again, my parents would go over to the other islands and do shopping, and, and my stepdad used to buy me shoes, right. as you do. Mm -hmm. And um, every time he bought me a pair of shoes, I threw them over the wall. You did not? I did. It's terrible, actually. And... <laughs> And, no, uh, secretary. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to do my career no end of good. <laughs> um, and one day, uh, and because I went to Sunday school, one mm. day one of the nuns came up to me and said, um, I'd like you to come to church and, and do a reading. Was there a big pile of shoes when she got there? <laughs> <laughs> We've no. counted on all these shoes here. <laughs> and, and I said, well, I'm sorry, I can't. And, and she was really surprised. And she says, well, why can't you? And she says, so I said, I'm sorry, but I don't have any shoes. And the most amazing thing she said to me, and that was kind of a little bit for me a God moment, that she says, you know what? God's not going to mind if you come to church without any shoes. And I did, and I read without shoes. And yeah. It, and that feeling, I'll, I'll never forget it, you know. Describe it if you may. Well, it's just walking in God's house mm. and just in bare, I think everybody should have that experience, in mm. bare feet and just feel the love um, pouring through you. And, I, you know, it's obviously, you know, where in the Caribbean, you know, our clothing is, is not as much as, in, in, you know, in, the, in where we are today in the winter and mm -hmm. uh, so there's something about kind of you know that freedom mm -hmm. that just it was just wonderful in my mind I've got this image of you walking into that church 
with your bare feet <laughs> and it feeling almost like you've been invited into God's home home. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm mindful of that when I'm at a friend's house, uh, and in particular someone I don't know very well, and they say, kick your shoes off, yeah. you're at home here because you're my friend. Yeah. And you take your shoes off, and there's something about taking your shoes off that kind of connects you with that house, their life, their environment, and there's a permission almost to be you. Yeah. You know, there's a permission for, for who you are to be valued. There's a permission for who you are, lock, stock and barrel, to be part mm. of this. Does that resonate? Yeah, very much so. And has that stayed with you? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in times of kind of, you know, questioning and, you know, in, in, in low times, mm. I often go back to that place because it's, yeah, you just, you, you just get that strength. It, it was a, a really happy memory it yeah. was it was something really good and it wasn't about you know not wearing shoes it was like you said it was about who you are mm -hmm. and um yeah i remember once listening to um a, a, a talk by uh, like an international speaker and it was a very very good talk but there was one line out of the 40 minute talk that stayed with me and it stayed with me ever since and it came to mind as you were talking and and this this international speaker she said we've got a god who says come as you are mm -hmm. And it feels like that's what you had, come as you are. Mm. And I love that. It's so permissioning. And may that be permissioning for you if, if you're feeling like you're not worthy or God's just too distant or you've got a, I don't know, a really shiny halo before God's going to want to know you. It's completely the opposite. Mm. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, so when it came to then working for the church, is that the, the job that you're doing now? Yes. So yeah. what were you doing before that? Because you've got a whole range of skills, haven't yeah. you? Like to yeah. do what you do, yeah. I can uh, genuinely, you know, it's, it's so detailed and there's a lot of legalities involved and other such things as well. I can half imagine you sort of almost being like a lawyer or having a legal background or something like that. So yeah. what did you do before you started working for the church? Um, well, I, I did a whole range of things, but... Um, when I lived in the Netherlands, I was working for um, an American oil company, uh -huh. um, selling bunker fuels and bunk fuels. bunker fuels. So the, the, the fuel that makes the ship sail. Oh, I see. Yeah. So and um, marine fuels and lubricants for the shipping industry. Um, and and then after that period, I got an opportunity to because I was in, in the aviation sector as well, I got an opportunity to go to Hong Kong. Oh, really? Yeah. And wow. It was a short-term opportunity. It was literally for six, seven months. I uh, ended up staying seven years. As you do? As you do. <laughs> and, and I was part of a team uh, working to, uh, on a bid for the new airport uh, project, and it was to do with... Um, aviation fuel mm -hmm. and making sure the system was in place so we were bidding for that as a, as a consortium and my role in that was a, in, a, in a way it was administrative it was project managing it um, and ultimately we didn't get the bid no. um, which was obviously quite sad mm -hmm. um, and then I worked for the airline <laughs> industry uh, for a year and my husband, um, he was working for a local Hong Kong Chinese company. Uh, and we both, we were there for the handover. Period. Really? Yes, so that was an extraordinary time. Um, and then we, um, uh, David said, look, you know, it's possible that our contracts won't be extended. How do you feel about moving to Cornwall? Had, what? <laughs> <laughs> So you're in Hong Kong <laughs> yeah. and you want to go to Cornwall, blessed yeah. place though it yes. is, but that's kind of like, what? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> why, why was that in his mind? Well, because if, um, when uh, with his family in, in, uh, when the kids were growing up, he basically uh, came to Cornwall on holiday. Oh, I see. And because it's such an amazing place and he remembered it from that time and did lots of sailing and, um, you know, there was, it was just, it felt just the right place to come to and possibly also you know the, the the temperature the climate was a bit different did it feel god ordained i don't know i there was something special about cornwall i i can't again put my hand on it i can't you know it was it was it, it, it just leapt off the page it was cornwall and i said yeah why not that sounds god ordained to me yeah Looking back on it now, yeah. w w are you able to speak with a little bit more clarity as to whether 
you think it was God, you know, leading you to this part of the world? Because obviously you've got a substantial, I'd say, ministry now. Yeah. Bringing in God's kingdom in this part of the world. Yeah. I'd have to really reflect on that a little bit more. No time like the present. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, again, it, it's having, you know, think actually thinking about it. It 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 does feel like. That was it, you know. Yeah. It, it was, there was no, there was no question about it. There was n not one iota, not one part of my body that said actually no. And I think which what was even probably more remarkable looking back is that, okay, our friends in Hong Kong said, well, there's no way you're going to, you're going to stay there. You'll be back, and we said no way. And um, my first year in Cornwall was really hard really? Um, and I you know I don't, don't have any problem admitting that and I think looking back I I made I made the same mistake as I think quite a few people do moving into Cornwall thinking we can change Cornwall oh, okay. and I think Cornwall changes you okay and it just gets under your skin is that a good uh, or a bad thing I think it's a good thing okay yeah and so my first year I thought I'm, I'm not going to hack this because it was so different. It mm. was, it was, in a way, it was a, a bit like um, well, growing up in the Caribbean because mm. it's, you know, oh, it's, yeah, it's that, imagine, actually, you've yeah. got that freedom. It's spacious. It's open. Uh, the people are wonderful, but it was just that it just felt really hard. It mm. felt like, and I think actually the thing was also I was trying to change things. You know, coming from the environment in Hong Kong, if anything you wanted to happen, it happened. Mm -hmm. You worked really hard and you made it happen. And in, <coughs> in Cornwall, <coughs> excuse me, in Cornwall, it felt really, it felt really hard. It felt like, we'll do it in our time. And then I thought by myself after a year, what, what am I trying to do? I'm not going to change Cornwall. Mm -hmm. Why am I in a hurry? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I thought, okay, well, there are two things. I can either leave my husband or, or, or just get on with it. It got to that sort of stage? Yeah. Wow. And I thought, no, I can't do this. I've got to try. I've got to get under this skin. Mm. And now 20 years on. Is it 20 years now? Yes. Golly. I, I can't even begin to think where else I would want to live. Really? And it's it's a magical place. Isn't that interesting about perseverance? <coughs> mm. So many things come to mind in terms of theology there. It's biblically based that God calls us to do things beyond our human ability, always. I don't think I've ever been called to do something that's been comfortable. Yeah. Um, it's always been beyond my human ability so that God can be God. And I have to lean on him and not my own abilities. Yeah. Um, and equally, there always seems to be with that, that challenge a time of um, adjustment. Yeah. A time of like you know maybe a bit of desert, a bit of like questioning God, where are you? Yeah. But then in the end, you come out, you blossom. It's that sort of mustard seed has to die so it can um, 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 grow into this massive tree and, and bear fruit. Upon which the birds will make their home, which no one yeah. ever sort of talks about. I love that yeah. bit. So it sounds re it resonates with that. Yeah. Um, but equally, um, I know a lot of people talk about Cornwall being a place that's pregnant with with something that's about to happen. I know that's a, a, a strong yeah. narrative and it happens and yeah. everyone's saying, well, when's it going to be then? All yeah, that kind of yeah. stuff. But I don't know. I still feel relatively new to this part of the Southwest. Yeah. I've only been here like two or so years. And it does feel pregnant with something that's about to happen and like God's positioning people for some sort of who knows what to be the case. Donna Birrell, the BBC presenter, yeah. uh, she sat where you are sitting now and she came from Hong Kong. Or she had a, a stint in Hong Kong. I don't know if you know that. No, I didn't. Yeah, watch her interview. She, she um, yeah, okay. forgive me if I get this slightly wrong, Donna, but she, um, she said she was out there, I think, on some sort of gap year sort of thing in Hong Kong. Um, she was in something like a hotel lobby, spied a policeman threw a plant in the lobby, <laughs> went up to the policeman and said, hi, and um, <laughs> married him. <laughs> As you do. As you do. And he was a policeman, British policeman in Hong Kong at the time, so she was out there for a good couple of years. Gosh. So why don't you guys swap stories? Yes, I will. But equally, talk about the fact that you guys, I would say being called to the Southwest and yeah. what that feels like. That could yeah. be a really good spiritual journey yeah. for you too, really, because she was in Putney, I think it was, having a really good life, working for the BBC, husband had a really good job, really, really nice middle-class existence, and they just said, oh, we've got to go to Cornwall. Got to go to Cornwall. And it just felt like you said, 
bang on right. Yeah. So I, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. something's happening. Very interesting. <laughs> so working for the church, <laughs> when did that come about? And you say me really? Talk to us about that. Yeah. You know the, you know, yeah. What, what, what was going on? That was def- especially with God. Yeah, that was definitely a God moment. I was working out in a in, in a place um, to do with telecoms uh, for a very small uh, company, um, and uh, the people who owned it were were just wonderful people. Um, but it wasn't really going in, in any direction. Okay. And um, at the time I was recruiting for them uh, into a couple of sales positions and I was talking to a recruitment agency and I said, look, you've got to get me out of here because I, <clears throat> I, can't, I can't do this anymore. My heart wasn't in it. Um, I, could, I, I wasn't making a difference. I, I was just not... Uh, it was it was all mechanical Mm -hmm. I mean there's nothing wrong with the company but it was just the work I was doing was not making any difference although I used to think telecoms and and all of that Mm -hmm. but I just didn't feel it was adding value and I wasn't getting getting any satisfaction and actually I was I'll never forget it because you know the the last couple of weeks towards the end of my time there um, (laughs) I had this old Land Rover and then that's another story. And um, where I worked, they allowed me to take the dog to work. And I had, <clears throat> we had our Springer Spaniel Ruby, uh, sorry, Amber at the time. <clears throat> and Amber would just sit hugged next to me while I cried my eyes out driving Aww. to work. And I thought, this is, this is not great. This is not, anyway. So I, while I was recruiting, I called the agency and I said, look, um, I'm going to call you at lunchtime because it's personal um, and I, I need you to get me out of here and, and what, what have you got on your books yeah um, anyway and she said well I've got something but I, I don't think you will really like it and I said okay well I don't care get me an interview and and I called her every hour wow saying, told you she's a bit scary <laughs> 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 I said to her, I said, and, and have you got me this interview? And eventually, I think she got so fed up with me that she she said, yes, I've got you an interview. And, and she said, but you're not going to like it. And, and I said, well, why not? Uh, and she said, well, it's for the church. And I thought, wow. Well, delve into how you felt before <clears throat> that you tell us more about the story. Because obviously you're a person of faith. You've just yeah. you said that. Uh, and here you are now about to potentially work for God, for yeah. the church. Yeah. What was going on spiritually in your heart? Well, I just thought, well, A, I didn't really, to be very honest, I didn't know anything about the diocese. Mm-hmm. You know, I, it, didn't, it didn't feature in my life. So I didn't even know that that organization existed right. in, in that kind of form. But just the, the thought of being part of an organization that where you can make a difference mm. and I just thought that just my heart just lifted really and I thought there must be something here there, there must be this is it this this and that's 11 years ago and um, yeah and and I wa- walked into the doors of this old building <laughs> A bit older than <laughs> the 70s. Um, and I, th- I, I thought I was going to be scared. I thought, mm-hmm. I, was, I thought I was going to be nervous. I mm-hmm. thought, um, and I, you know, obviously when you have done a few jobs, you know, interviews at the best of times are kind of really scary. I'm rubbish at interviews. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm not good at them either. And I, I was just myself. And a week later, I started there. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about that? Because yeah. we've just touched on you coming down yeah. to Cornwall um, and, and, you know, after a substantial amount of time in the international city of Hong Kong, would you say now that you've been in this job for a few years that perhaps a large part of the reason that God wanted you to be in the Southwest is to do what you're doing now, thus calling? Yeah. How does that make you feel? Um, sometimes really good, uh-huh. 
but sometimes I feel the weight mm. of of what that means. Mm. Um, and I think anybody across you know any any work that that means a lot to you will have moments of doubt mm -hmm. whether you're good enough oh. and you know you, you have that and Constantly. I think yeah but in a way that's at the same time that actually makes you the person you are mm -hmm. and actually adds to your just your strength of faith mm -hmm. um, but you know I, I don't think I'm good I, d I don't think I'm good enough um, doing what I'm doing you know, I have got doubts, but mm. at the same time I know that God is there and as long as I think that if I can make a, a small difference to people's lives, that that's okay. Wow. God, that got me, that did. That was amazing. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, I do, I really, I do get emotional about it because it means so much to me. I think... Uh, the job does, you know, it, it is, um, it, um, it, it, yeah, it, it's, it's the beating, you know, it, it's the beating heart of everything that you do and, and I can't help but feel responsible. Um, at times when things are, are really, really tough in, in, in the church, you know, when, when you feel we've got so many challenges and you just, and I, I know, I know that God m means to challenge us. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be easy. Talk right? about that. Well, I think if it's easy, then you just don't value things. Mm -hmm. If it's, if, if you get given things on a plate mm. and you haven't really had to work hard for it whether it's you know kind of emotionally or physically then it doesn't mean anything mm. and and so I think God is telling us you know God is telling us that there's something needs to happen mm. and and we've got to lean into the challenges and I think in 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 the church at the moment mm. um, and and I think we desperately need to be able to talk more about our faith mm -hmm. in in a way that people understand mm -hmm. and I think that that's that there's a there's a gap and I think for me for making it more understandable I think we, we just need to make sure that people understand that faith is about love. Mm. That that's what it is ultimately. And if we can love each other as we should, then you know, we've we've come a long way. And I, I think at the moment there's so much anger in the world. Mm. Uh, so unnecessary and um we, we just, you know, I, this morning, you know, on the train, you know, just a simple smile to somebody who looked a bit miserable, just lightened their face. And if you can just do one small kind thing a day, despite the kind of the challenges you've got at the office or wherever, or at home or, you know, it just makes such a difference. And I think that's all part of our, of who we are and how we're meant to be. God, there's a whole range of questions coming into my mind as you're saying that because I think we're spending a lot of time in the church thinking about how it's best to do what we do yeah, so we yeah. can reach more people. Yeah. But I think there needs to be some honest questions about whether we're asking the right questions and whether actually what we're doing is meant to be the thing we're doing. Are we, are we meant to be doing what we're doing better or is it actually we just need to sort of like have that as part of our view but maybe there needs to be completely new things. Yeah. Um, it, as you are talking, it's like it seems to boil down to communication and getting the message out that actually it's about love yeah. and it's about God saying, I love you, please, yeah. please be in relationship with me. This is what it's all about. Mm. That's what it's all about. And that's what the church is there to be a vehicle to achieve. Yeah. And, and yet we seem to perhaps spend an awful lot of time on, I'm just going to say everything other than that. Yeah. 
Well, we just like um, on the way from the railway station, you know, we talked talked about you being on the moor and there's something of a beauty there because if we could just, we, we just get bogged down in buildings, we get bogged down in materialism and we forget about God. Mm -hmm. And if we can just be liberated from all that stuff, mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the, I mean, of course we have got the house of God and of course it's a place where we gather and it's the center of the community and, it, and that's really important. Mm. But we mustn't forget why, that, why that's there. And I think that's, you know, and that's, like you said, it's the thing we need to start, well not start, we need, we need to think more about and what we can do to change that. So move, thank you for that. Yeah. So move on. Would you believe we're running out of time? Because, you know, I don't want to sort of, <laughs> you've got to get a train. Um, it says here in your notes, um, well, one of them is, um, don't be afraid. Yeah. What's that yeah. about? Well, that was an incredible part of my life um, eight years ago um, when my mother uh, had been diagnosed with cancer, which was not um, operable or curable. And she was living in the Netherlands and I had a job here. I was not the dancers and secretary then, I was still assistant. And, um, and so, you know, I was going back and forth uh, to the Netherlands and uh, uh, she found out in December that that, that was the situation. And then um, I kept going back and forth. And then in the March, my, my uh, brother called me and said, I think you need to come home because your mum's waiting for you. So I went home. And she said, look, you know, I am going to die, and, but I want you to be here. I want you, I want to die at home, and mm. I want you to be here for me. And that was the most amazing gift I've ever had. It was so, it was such a privilege because, you know what, you know, you, that's, you'll do it, that's what you do. Mm. And um, so I said yes. And then I called Bishop Tim and then I called my husband <laughs> and said, look, I'm going to be here for a while and I don't know how long it's going to be, but my focus has got to be on my mum. Mm -hmm. and, and she died in June. Mm -hmm. And this really small lady who had a will of iron found the inner strength from March to June to, to live. Wow. And so, you know, I looked after her 24 hours a day, washed her, and, and towards the end, the, the, in the Netherlands, you have a very good care package, and they, right. you can stay at home and, you know, yeah. uh, with the right support. But in that period, I got to know my mum so deeply. And, you know, you think, I just wished I'd known all of the stuff before, but we got talking about faith. Really? And it was the last thing that, I'd expected. Yeah. And my mum taught me such an important lesson then. She says, look, just because you've never seen me go to church doesn't mean I've never had faith. What's her name? Gretje. Glad you said that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Margaret in, oh. in, in English. And it was, it was astonishing. And so we, we got talking. And uh, she had a deep faith. And so she said, you know, don't ever be afraid. And, mm -hmm. and that just stayed with me. And uh, it was just, yeah. And, and actually at the time I was, I was quite ashamed because I, I didn't even know. And I never asked, mm -hmm. you know. And as children, yeah, you just assume. Uh, and that's another a really important thing is that, you know, I've learned that you just, if, if you don't know, it's never going to hurt to ask. <laughs> so what would you say God was doing in that time then? <clears throat> I, I think he, he was building both our strength and he was getting, and, and, and I, I think her, Faith was so strong that she she wasn't afraid of dying. Wow. She was very calm about it, and she says, "I know wherever I'm going, I'm going to be safe." Oh, 
amazing woman. Yeah, and um, yeah, it was just extraordinary. Yeah. I feel like I'm being ministered to by your mum. <laughs> Hello, Margaret. Yeah. yeah. Wow, thank you for that. I mean, that bless many, many people watching this. So what year was that, sorry? 2011. So the next year you were baptised and confirmed. Mm. Tell us about that. Well, I, I just had to, in, in my own way, had to make that promise to my mum. Right. And it was, it was so sad she couldn't be there. But, you know, it was kind of going back to that conversation when I was really angry with her and saying, mm. why can't I be confirmed like all my friends? Mm. And she says, you've got to, you've got to be strong in your faith. It's your decision. You've got to be ready. And I felt that through that journey, that was, you know, that, that was just the kind of confirming where I was already in my life. Mm -hmm. But it was, it, it just meant so much to me and obviously I couldn't do it at the time when she was dying mm. so it just felt right. So present day, yes. <laughs> who's Esther Pollard now? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, <clears throat> With reference to God. <laughs> yes. Um, a f very, very settled in my faith. It's so important to me. Um, I've got more confidence. Um, one of the things I do still really struggle with is, um, you know, I still that question, you know, am I a good disciple? Am I, am I you know, am I good enough? And I think that that will continue to be like that. You know, I, I have grown in confidence. My faith is far deeper. Um, and stronger. I, th I think it's it's will never be kind of a, you know it's not like reading a book. You don't come to the end of it. it it's just an ongoing thing, and it changes. Mm. Um, uh, and I think one of the things for many people, well, for me, praying is so important. Mm. But um, I find it really difficult to. To, it's kind of, I'm just very, I think, um, I'm just trying to find the right word. Um, I'm very selfish. I, I just, I, w I want Jesus for myself. <sighs> and when I talk to him, that, that's, that's our conversation. So praying in, in, in public uh, or being kind of spontaneous, if you like, and, and, and having that gift. Mm. For me, that's in me, mm. um, and and those are things that you just kind of live with and uh, get better at, and as a person mm -hmm. and in everything you do. So uh, yeah, I think Jesus has a wonderful way of having no favourites but making you feel like his favourite. It's <laughs> yes. wonderful that. Yeah. So um, as we're coming into land, um, I want to ask you this: It's kind of like. We go through seasons in our relationship with God, um, and, and sometimes He feels different. Sometimes yeah. He feels like loving Father. Yeah. Sometimes He feels like distant God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes He feels like overwhelmingly imminent God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes He feels like policeman in the sky. Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes <laughs> He just feels like just full of forgiveness, grace, and everything else. How does God feel to you right now? Right now. Um, he. Hmm. Sometimes a mystery at the moment. Oh, okay. So, although I know he, he is there, I still have moments that I'm thinking, I'm not quite sure what you're asking me mm -hmm. to do. Um, and it's kind of, okay, you work that out. And, um, and, and so I, I just don't think there is that answer. Um, and I think... Yeah, so when things are kind of a bit tough and challenging, um, I, I just think, you know, it's easy to expect the answer to fall into your lap. And, and, and so, you know, it's just trying to figure out. I, th I guess what I'm trying to say um, is that it's, he wants us to work it out. 
but at the same time, you know, we, we need to know that we can't always have the answer. You don't have to answer this if you don't, we can edit it out. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm always conscious of the viewers, which as the channel grows, literally could be anywhere in the world. Yeah. And as soon as you've had this sort of like multicultural, multi-country sort of <laughs> existence and so forth, it kind of gives it a little bit more gravitas. For anyone who's watching this, maybe in a good time, maybe in a bad time, um, with your, your journey of faith in front of you and in your heart, what would you, if you want to say, what would you say to someone about faith and about the reality of God and about the reality of Jesus, who's maybe watching this and thinking, well, I'm, I'm either an atheist, but I'm, I'm open, yeah. or actually I'm really open, but nothing's happening. What would you just say to someone about, you know, because you talk so powerfully about how it's all so simple and we make it so complicated, yeah, if yeah. I may summarise. Yeah. And that's probably, you've already said it in some sense, but yeah. if there was just like a paragraph of yeah. like encouragement for someone out there. I, I would just say open your heart and, and let the love in. Boom! <laughs> just see that's that. just fabulous. Mm, now, this has been such a powerful interview. It always feels a bit sort of in Congress actually coming to my game at the end. <laughs> but if it's okay, it would be great to sort of finish. I call it Spotlight. A friend of mine, John Thurston, okay. came up with a name uh, for the thing. But it's just a fun way of ending the okay. interview. Uh, the questions are, um, in one sense, very simple. But as I often say, um, a psychologist will have a field day with them, okay? Um, and then if it's okay, um, you don't have to. I can do it if yeah. it's not something you're... you're sort of used to. If you can pray us out, that would be brilliant. But you don't have to, I can do it for us if that's if what you, you wouldn't want. mind. Oh, no yeah, problem at all. Thank you. So you happy to play this game? Yeah, go on. Spotlight, <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> Quick yes. fire answers, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the thing you can't live without. My husband. Boom. <laughs> um, film star crush. Oh my word. <laughs> uh, who does that um. fancy? <laughs> Uh, Roger Moore. Oh, really? No longer, uh, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, secret pleasure. Oh, gosh. Uh, uh, strictly. Of course. Cool. Strictly Come <laughs> Dancing. If you're watching this in another country, uh, it's a really, really successful show. Have you ever seen An Angel? Yes. Ooh. We're asked at the end. Um, Favourite cereal? I'm not a breakfast eater. Oh, you're not? Mm. Okay, cool. Um, dark chocolate or milk chocolate? Oh, I'm not a chocolate eater. No! No! <laughs> Can you reverse park? Yes. Whoa! Uh, when were you happiest? Um, uh, when I got married. Really? Good answer. You're in heaven for the very first time, and you meet Jesus for the first time. What's the first thing that you'd like him to say to you? Wow. Welcome into my arms. Yeah. You're in heaven for the first time, and you meet Jesus for the first time. What's the first thing that you like to ask him? What could we have done better? You're in heaven for the first time, <laughs> and you meet Jesus for the first time. Um, who's the first family member you'd like to meet? Oh, yeah, my mum. Can I pray us out? Yes. And can I, once again, thank you so much for this interview. You've spoken from the heart, you've spoken with such bravery as well, and such pioneering um, language and, and, and bravery as well. I, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you that you prompted Esther to say yes to an interview. Thank you for that which you have done in her life so far. Thank you for the work that you have called her to do in Truro Diocese in the Church of England. May we pray for your grace upon her and your calling to be ever more stronger and clearer and energised as she journeys forward. May she never lose sight of what it's all about. And for those who are watching this, Father, touch them with the power of your Holy Spirit. Open their hearts, as Esther said, to you and your invitation to be in a relationship of love with you. Fill them all with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.